And now chapter 13, The Stealing of the Boys and Calves by Brahma. Srila Shukdev Goswami said, O best of devotees, most fortunate Pariksit, you have inquired very nicely, for although constantly hearing the pastimes of the Lord, you are perceiving His activities to be newer and newer. Paramahamsas, devotees who have accepted the essence of life, are attached to Krishna in the core of their hearts, and He is the aim of their lives. It is their nature to talk only of Krishna at every moment, as if such topics were newer and newer. They are attached to such topics, just as materialists are attached to topics of women and sex. O King, kindly hear me with great attention. Although the activities of the Supreme Lord are very confidential, no ordinary man being able to understand them I shall speak about them to you, for spiritual masters explain to a submissive disciple even subject matters that are very confidential and difficult to understand. Then, after saving the boys and calves from the mouth of Agasura, who is death personified, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, brought them all to the bank of the river and spoke the following words. My dear friends, just see how this river bank is extremely beautiful because of its pleasing atmosphere. And just see how the blooming lotuses are attracting bees and birds by their aroma. The humming and chirping of the bees and birds is echoing throughout the beautiful trees in the forest. Also, here the sands are clean and soft. Therefore, this must be considered the best place for our sporting and pastimes. I think we should take our lunch here, since we are already hungry, because the time is very late. Here the calves may drink water and go slowly here and there and eat the grass. Accepting Lord Krishna's proposal, the cowherd boys allowed the calves to drink water from the river and then tied them to trees where there was green tender grass. Then the boys opened their baskets of food and began eating with Krishna in great transcendental pleasure. Like the whirl of a lotus flower surrounded by its petals and leaves, Krishna sat in the center encircled by lines of his friends who all looked very beautiful. Every one of them was trying to look forward toward Krishna, thinking that Krishna might look toward him. In this way, they all enjoyed their lunch in the forest. Among the cowherd boys, some placed their lunch on flowers, some on leaves, fruits, or bunches of leaves, some actually in their baskets, some on the bark of trees, and some on rocks. This is what the children imagined to be their plates as they ate their lunch. All the cowherd boys enjoyed their lunch with Krishna, showing one another the different tastes of the different varieties of preparations they had brought from home. Tasting one another's preparations, they began to laugh and make one another laugh. Krishna is yagyabuk, that is, he eats only offerings of yagya. But to exhibit his childhood pastimes, he now sat with his flute tucked between his waist and his tight cloth on his right side, and with his horn, bugle, and cow-driving stick on his left. Holding in his hand a very nice preparation of yogurt and rice, with pieces of suitable fruit between his fingers, he sat like the whirl of a lotus flower, looking forward toward all his friends, personally joking with them and creating jubilant laughter among them as he ate. 
At that time, the denizens of heaven were watching, struck with wonder at how the personality of Godhead, who eats only in Yajna, was now eating with his friends in the forest. O Maharaj Pariksit, while the cowherd boys, who knew nothing within the core of their hearts but Krishna, were thus engaged in eating their lunch in the forest, the calves went far away, deep into the forest, being allured by green grass. When Krishna saw that his friends, the cowherd boys, were frightened, he, the fierce controller even of fear itself, said, just to mitigate their fear, My dear friends, do not stop eating. I shall bring your calves back to this spot by personally going after them myself. Let me go and search for the calves, Krishna said. Don't disturb your enjoyment. Then, carrying his yogurt and rice in his hand, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, immediately went out to search for the calves of his friends. To please his friends, he began searching in all the mountains, mountain caves, bushes, and narrow passages. O Maharaj Pariksit, Brahma, who resides in the higher planetary system in the sky, had observed the activities of the most powerful Krishna in killing and delivering Agasura, and he was astonished. Now that same Brahma wanted to show some of his own power and see the power of Krishna, who was engaged in his childhood pastimes, playing as if with ordinary cowherd boys. Therefore, in Krishna's absence, Brahma took all the boys and calves to another place. Thus he became entangled, for in the very near future he would see how powerful Krishna was. Thereafter, when Krishna was unable to find the calves, he returned to the bank of the river. But there he was also unable to see the cowherd boys. Thus he began to search for both the calves and the boys, as if he could not understand what had happened. When Krishna was unable to find the calves and their caretakers, the cowherd boys, anywhere in the forest, he could suddenly understand that this was the work of Lord Brahma. Thereafter, just to create pleasure for both Brahma and for the mothers of the calves and cowherd boys, Krishna, the creator of the entire cosmic manifestation, expanded himself as calves and boys. By his Vasudeva feature, Krishna simultaneously expanded himself into the exact number of missing cowherd boys and calves, with their exact bodily features, their particular types of hands, legs, and other limbs, their sticks, bugles, and flutes, their lunch bags, their particular types of dress and ornaments placed in various ways, their names, ages and forms, and their special activities and characteristics. By expanding himself in this way, beautiful Krishna proved the statement, Samagra Jagad Vishnu Mayam, which means, Lord Vishnu is all-pervading. Now expanding himself so as to appear as all the calves and cowherd boys, all of them as they were, and at the same time appear as their leader, Krishna entered Vrajabhumi, the land of his father, Nanda Maharaj, just as he usually did while enjoying their company. O Maharaj Pariksit, Krishna, who had divided himself as different calves and also as different cowherd boys, entered different cowsheds as the calves and then different homes as different boys. The mothers of the boys, upon hearing the sounds of the flutes and bugles being played by their sons, immediately rose from their household tasks, lifted their boys onto their laps, embraced them with both arms, and began to feed them with their breast milk, which flowed forth because of extreme love specifically for Krishna. Actually, Krishna is everything, but at that time, expressing extreme love and affection, they took special pleasure in feeding Krishna, the Parabrahman, and Krishna drank the milk from his respective mothers as if it were a nectarine beverage. Thereafter, O Maharaj Pariksit, as required according to the scheduled round of his pastimes, 
Krishna returned in the evening, entered the house of each of the cowherd boys, and engaged exactly like the former boys, thus enlivening their mothers with transcendental pleasure. The mothers took care of the boys by massaging them with oil, bathing them, smearing their bodies with sandalwood pulp, decorating them with ornaments, chanting protective mantras, decorating their bodies with tilak, and giving them food. In this way, the mothers served Krishna personally. Thereafter, all the cows entered their different sheds and began mooing loudly, calling for their respective calves. When the calves arrived, the mothers began licking the calves' bodies again and again, and profusely feeding them with the milk flowing from their milk bags. Previously, from the very beginning, the gopis had motherly affection for Krishna. Indeed, their affection for Krishna exceeded even their affection for their own sons. In displaying their affection, they had thus distinguished between Krishna and their sons, but now that distinction disappeared. Although the inhabitants of Rajabhumi, the cowherd men and cowherd women, previously had more affection for Krishna than for their own children, now for one year their affection for their own sons continuously increased, for Krishna had now become their sons. There was no limit to the increment of their affection for their sons, who were now Krishna. Every day they found new inspiration for loving their children as much as they loved Krishna. In this way, Lord Sri Krishna, having himself become the cowherd boys and groups of calves, maintained himself by himself. Thus he continued his pastimes both in Vrindavan and in the forest for one year. One day, five or six nights before the completion of the year, Krishna, tending the calves, entered the forest along with Balaram. Thereafter, while pasturing atop Govardhan Hill, the cows looked down to find some green grass and saw their calves pasturing near Vrindavan not very far away. When the cows saw their own calves from the top of Govardhan Hill, they forgot themselves and their caretakers because of increased affection. And although the path was very rough, they ran toward their calves with great anxiety, each running as if with one pair of legs. Their milk bags full and flowing with milk, their heads and tails raised, and their humps moving with their necks, they ran forcefully until they reached their calves to feed them. The cows had given birth to new calves, but while coming down from Govardhan Hill, the cows, because of increased affection for the older calves, allowed the older calves to drink milk from their milk bags, and then began licking the calves' bodies in anxiety as if wanting to swallow them. The cowherd men, having been unable to check the cows from going to their calves, felt simultaneously ashamed and angry. They crossed the rough road with great difficulty, and when they came down and saw their own sons, they were overwhelmed by great affection. At that time, all the thoughts of the cowherd men merged in the mellow of paternal love, which was aroused by the sight of their sons. Experiencing a great attraction, their anger completely disappearing, they lifted their sons, embraced them in their arms, and enjoyed the highest pleasure by smelling their sons' heads. Thereafter, the elderly cowherd men, having obtained great feeling from embracing their sons, gradually and with great difficulty and reluctance, ceased embracing them and returned to the forest. But as the men remembered their sons, tears began to roll down from their eyes. Because of an increase of affection, the cows had constant attachment even to those calves that were grown up and had stopped sucking milk from their mothers. When Baladev saw this attachment, he was unable to understand the reason for it, and thus he began to consider as follows. What is this wonderful phenomenon? The affection of all the inhabitants of Vraja, including me, toward these boys and calves is increasing as never before, just like our affection for Lord Krishna, the super-soul of all living entities. Who is this mystic power, and where has she come from? Is she a demigod or a demoness? 
she must be the illusory energy of my master, Lord Krishna, for who else can bewilder me? Thinking in this way, Lord Balaram was able to see, with the eye of transcendental knowledge, that all these calves and Krishna's friends were expansions of the form of Sri Krishna. Lord Baladev said, O Supreme Controller, these boys are not great demigods as I previously thought, nor are these calves great sages like Nodded. Now I can see that you alone are manifesting yourself in all varieties of difference. Although one, you are existing in the different forms of the calves and boys. Please briefly explain this to me. Having thus been requested by Lord Baladev, Krishna explained the whole situation and Baladev understood it. When Lord Brahma returned, after a moment of time had passed, according to his own measurement, he saw that although by human measurement a complete year had passed, Lord Krishna, after all that time, was engaged just as before in playing with the boys and calves who were his expansions. Lord Brahma thought, Whatever boys and calves there were in Gokul, I have kept them sleeping on the bed of my mystic potency, and to this very day they have not yet risen again. A similar number of boys and calves have been playing with Krishna for one whole year, yet they are different from the ones illusioned by my mystic potency. Who are they? Where did they come from? Thus Lord Brahma, thinking and thinking for a long time, tried to distinguish between those two sets of boys who were each separately existing. He tried to understand who was real and who was not real, but he couldn't understand at all. Thus, because Lord Brahma wanted to mystify the all-pervading Lord Krishna, who can never be mystified, but who, on the contrary, mystifies the entire universe, he himself was put into bewilderment by his own mystic power. As the darkness of snow on a dark night and the light of a glowworm in the light of day have no value, the mystic power of an inferior person who tries to use it against a person of great power is unable to accomplish anything. Instead, the power of that inferior person is diminished. Then, while Lord Brahma looked on, all the calves and the boys tending them immediately appeared to have complexions the color of bluish rain clouds and to be dressed in yellow silken garments. All those personalities had four arms holding conch shell, disc, mace, and lotus flower in their hands. They wore helmets on their heads, earrings on their ears, and garlands of forest flowers around their necks. On the upper portion of the right side of their chests was the emblem of the goddess of fortune. Furthermore, they wore armlets on their arms, the Kostuba gem around their necks, which were marked with three lines like a conch shell, and bracelets on their wrists, with bangles on their ankles, ornaments on their feet, and sacred belts around their waists, they all appeared very beautiful. Every part of their bodies, from their feet to the top of their heads, was fully decorated with fresh, tender garlands of Tulsi leaves offered by devotees engaged in worshipping the Lord by the greatest pious activities, namely hearing and chanting. Those Vishnu forms, by their pure smiling, which resembled the increasing light of the moon, and by the sidelong glances of their reddish eyes, created and protected the desires of their own devotees, as if by the modes of passion and goodness. All beings, both moving and non-moving, from the four-headed Lord Brahma down to the most insignificant living entity, had taken forms and were differently worshipping those Vishnu Murtis according to their respective capacities, with various means of worship, such as dancing and singing. 
All the Vishnu Murtis were surrounded by the opulences, headed by Anima Siddhi, by the mystic potencies, headed by Aja, and by the twenty-four elements for the creation of the material world, headed by the Mahat Tattva. Then Lord Brahma saw that Kala, the time factor, Svabhava, one's own nature by association, Samskara, reformation, Kama, desire, Karma, fruit of activity, and the Gunas, the three modes of material nature, their own independence being completely subordinate to the potency of the Lord, had all taken forms and were also worshipping those Vishnu Murtis. The Vishnu Murtis all had eternal unlimited forms, full of knowledge and bliss, and existing beyond the influence of time. Their great glory was not even to be touched by the jnanis engaged in studying the Upanishads. Thus Lord Brahma saw the Supreme Brahman, by whose energy this entire universe, with its moving and non-moving living beings, is manifested. He also saw at the same time all the calves and boys as the Lord's expansions. Then by the power of the effulgence of those Vishnu Murtis, Lord Brahma, his eleven senses jolted by astonishment and stunned by transcendental bliss, became silent, just like a child's clay doll in the presence of the village deity. The Supreme Brahman is beyond mental speculation. He is self-manifest, existing in his own bliss, and he is beyond the material energy. He is known by the crest jewels of the Vedas by reputation of irrelevant knowledge. Thus, in relation to that Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead, whose glory had been shown by the manifestation of all the four-armed forms of Vishnu, Lord Brahma, the Lord of Sarasvati, was mystified. What is this, he thought, and then he was not even able to see. Lord Krishna, understanding Brahma's position, then at once removed the curtain of his Yoga Maya. Lord Brahma's external consciousness then revived, and he stood up just like a dead man coming back to life. Opening his eyes with great difficulty, he saw the universe along with himself. Then, looking in all directions, Lord Brahma immediately saw Vrindavan before him, filled with trees, which were the means of livelihood for the inhabitants, and which were equally pleasing in all seasons. Vrindavan is the transcendental abode of the Lord, where there is no hunger, anger, or thirst. Though naturally inimical, both human beings and fierce animals live there together in transcendental friendship. Then Lord Brahma saw the Absolute Truth, who is one without a second, who possesses full knowledge, and who is unlimited, assuming the role of a child in a family of cowherd men, and standing all alone, just as before, with a morsel of food in his hand, searching everywhere for the calves and his cowherd friends. After seeing this, Lord Brahma hastily got down from his swan carrier, fell down like a golden rod, and touched the lotus feet of Lord Krishna with the tips of the four crowns on his heads. Offering his obeisances, he bathed the feet of Lord Krishna with the water of his tears of joy. Rising and falling again and again at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna for a long time, Lord Brahma remembered over and over the Lord's greatness he had just seen. Then, rising very gradually, and wiping his two eyes, Lord Brahma looked up at Mukunda. Lord Brahma, his head bent low, his mind concentrated and his body trembling, very humbly began with faltering words to offer praises to Lord Krishna. Thus ends the thirteenth chapter of the tenth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled The Stealing of the Boys and Calves by Brahma.